continue to discuss the themes that this uh, raises for the general public uh, later today. And uh, for our first panel, um, uh, we have uh, uh, a chair in Dan Brock, uh, a very senior ethicist from uh, here, the medical school. And I'll pass, uh, pass this on to you. I'll just mention all of us, all speakers, should really stick to seven minutes. Uh, these are very short interventions so that uh, we have a lot of time to, for discussion. And Stephanie Dent here, who uh, is the chief whip at the SAFRA Center and so much more, uh, will really keep us on time because she has this scary alarm clock that will go off at seven minutes. And there is a bathroom on the left, and I think we can start. Thank you, Nir. Uh, I was responsible for hiring Nir here, but I didn't know he had this talent to draw so rapidly <laughs> as he did up there. Now, I have um, this uh, tent with my name on it facing you, but as I got older, I've joked that um, I often have it facing me, so I remember who I am, <laughs> but I'll leave it that way. Um, a couple of comments since this is the first session. Um, you've just heard that speakers are urged isn't, I guess, strong enough, will be required to stick to seven minutes. Um, comments um, need not be directed at a specific speaker. Uh, they can be. Uh, and I won't al always um, ask the speaker uh, to comment on the comment uh, that has been made. Uh, the, um, we will not have long or even short introductions. They are all on this in your, in your packet. Uh, uh, we're doing that to save time, not because you're not distinguished. Uh, and um, uh, then I think we can, um, uh, I think we can start. And uh, we return to uh, near for the first presentation. How do I, do you guys activate it or do I? Are you going to draw for us some more? Uh, <laughs> how do I get the PowerPoint on guys? Okay, you got it. Great. And I activate it through this computer. Great. So this is just a few words, a few more words uh, for us on what we're going to do today. I'm going to start with an example that would give you a flavor of the potential impact that something like the labels that we've just discussed could have. Um, medical tourism is the name of travel of a person, of a resident of one country to another country to get medical care. It's a booming business that is going to uh, expand rapidly even more in coming years. It, it has a lot of wonderful potentials for the Patients who get affordable, seemingly high quality care uh, for the countries to, whom, to where uh, patients go. Often the centers are in India and in Thailand. Uh, they could definitely use the income. But there is some worry also about the impact that this has on health worker availability in these countries, which have critical health worker shortages in, in pockets, uh, especially in rural areas. Uh, both in Thailand and in India. Basically, workers get higher salaries for working for the tourists in these private hospitals that serve also local elites, and they are, uh, according to these concerns, less available for the patients in the countryside, uh, for the, the urban poor. Is there a way to realize the good things about medical tourism without encountering the bad things about it. Well, suppose the tourist hospitals started saying, you know, from now on, we're going to do great things for the community. Uh, we're going to help the urban poor get their care. We're going to do things for remote rural patients that are uh, within our power. They're supposed by law in India in return for some loans and, and uh, land that they got, many of them, to give to reserve 10% of beds for the urban poor. And according to India's own courts, that's not happening. That would be fantastic. But of course, how do we enforce that? Self-regulation currently is not working. Uh, they're not doing it out of their own volition. 
you might think that the country government, India or Thailand, uh, could impose that, and in principle, legally, they could, but there's a reason why the Indian government is not enforcing its own laws on this matter. A possible explanation is that they are in a collective action problem. They are competing for tourists with Thailand and with many other countries in the Caribbean, in Turkey, in the Gulf, around the world. If hospitals in India are forced to provide more services for the local community, they will have to jack up the prices some, and the tourists might just turn elsewhere. So there is a global collective action problem. Even hospital managers who want to do nice things for their communities, their doctors, they care, even health ministries or countries that want to do good things can't afford to do this because of this general situation. So we need some sort of Leviathan. You might think, oh, WHO would do that. But WHO doesn't have the teeth. But there is actually some group of actors that hospitals do listen to around the world. They do a lot of things uh, that otherwise they would not do because these organizations demand that they do them. And these are um, quality um, accreditors who come to hospitals and force them to uh, provide good and safe care for their patients in ways that go beyond what these doctors spontaneously um, would have provided in these hospitals. Um, JCI is the main accreditor around the world. It's uh, for doctors who practice in Boston. It's the uh, global affiliate of um, JCO, which is familiar uh, to you. And it certifies a lot of these hospitals for that. Maybe if JCI added to their more than 300 standards, some standards about these matters, about we demand that you do A, B, C for communities, um, maybe they would uh, listen. So it is striking how much potential power a label, an accreditor, a certifier could in principle have on these industries because these hospitals need the accreditation to get referrals from the clients, from the patients, uh, from the doctors who send these patients, and that's um, an important bottom line decision for them. So what are we going to do today? Uh, in the rest of this session, we're going to start local. We're going to talk about several labeling, reporting related initiatives that happen here at Harvard of very different scales. Um, we're going to then continue to see how much labels uh, for uh, the health impact of companies could be tailored to address more closely the factors that uh, affect our species health the most. The things that affect, that create the most burden of disease globally. Because we want, our thought today is that we would like to try to seek ways not to just use this tool, rating companies, uh, as a tool for keeping these companies ethically pure, ethically nice, ethically okay. We're thinking more of trying to mobilize this to become an important force in global health delivery so that the vast resources of companies could generate a lot more revenue and a lot less harm uh, for global health. And we're going to talk about that in that session. The basic mechanism here, labels are disclosure mechanisms, and we're going to talk about the fundamental mechanics of this and also about the problematic aspects of relying on disclosure for improving outcomes. We're going to then, after lunch, um, have a talk about whether it's appropriate for people with money, consumers, investors, to do this vigilante, potentially, ethical intervention in what's happening in the global arena. Uh, we're going to talk then about standards and uh, metrics for these um, um, labels. Uh, metrics are the more measurable aspects, more quantifiable aspects that you want to focus on in order to assess the fundamental standards. And finally, we'll talk about how to stop industry who has a lot of stake in what's going on here from, um, in some ways, corrupting the system. And I'm done. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're gonna near, near is setting an example for all the rest of you of stopping right when the uh, alarm goes off. And I think that we're, we're going to stick to the original order. Okay. 
the uh, next speaker then is Carolina Nasig. And you can, you can speak either from there or from there. <laughs> but not in between. There's no microphone in between. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the organizers, um, to Nir, Jennifer, and Katie for organizing this. And it's really my pleasure to be here with you today and with everybody who will be watching online later to describe a rating system which the student group Universities Allied for Central Medicines have developed, has developed to rate universities and research institutions regarding their impact on global health. So, Again, my name is uh, Carolina Masiag. I've been a volunteer with the University's Allied for Central Medicine since I began my very long MD-PhD uh, gradu uh, graduate and medical program. Um, and my research is not uh, in public health. My research is in basic science. I'm an immunologist. And so as a bench scientist aspiring to practice medicine, like many of my classmates, I wanted to help uh, work on technologies which would eventually benefit not only patients in the developed world, but patients throughout the world. So that was part of the motivation for me personally um, and for many of my colleagues. So University is Allied for Central Medicines has a tripartite goal. and. Um, like our rankings, um, in our rankings, we didn't give out any easy A's. Um, and that's because our organization tackles the issues which have been neglected by universities so far. So our goal is simply to leverage academic research for global health. Um, and we do this through innovation, access, and empowerment. So more particularly, um, ah. so very quickly, innovation, we, mean, we define quite narrowly to mean innovation lab research on the neglected diseases. Uh, so several organizations have defined neglected diseases as a list of 12 to 17 diseases which receive uh, less funding, less research, less basic research, less translation or res translational research, and have less medical products, devices, drugs, uh, diagnostics, and vaccines uh, for these diseases, although cumulatively these diseases affect over 2 billion people in the world. And in, according to some ratings, HIV, TB, and malaria, or the big three, can be included or not in the definition of neglected diseases. Um, for access, we look at uh, something called global access licensing. I could give a whole other presentation on global access licensing in general. Um, but basically, the concept is that technology transfer is the way through which uh, discoveries in basic research and university innovations make their way to industry and eventually to the rest of the world. And so by um, by owning their intellectual property, thanks to the Baidol law, universities have significant leverage over how that intellectual property that they produce will later be developed. Um, and uh, so we measure ways in which they can do so in globally accessible or responsible ways. And finally, empowerment is the education of the student body in critical access and innovation issues that affect global health according to our definitions above. So our target audiences for our Global Health um, University Impact Report Card are students, universities, and the academic community, the press, and then hopefully also eventually global health decision makers, influencers, and if we're lucky, even funding bodies. The context in which we're operating is, uh, quite, uh, is quite urgent. Um, I've noted here just an excerpt of one of many, many you know, economic biotech blog posts talking about how, um, how the academy, how universities are a great source for pharma, for biotechs, for startups to develop technologies, how they're a very fertile resource, um, especially in economic crunch times when many companies want to outsource as much of their brick and mortar um, labs and research. So uh, the criteria by which we judge universities, so are universities investing strongly in medical research that addresses the neglected health needs of low-income communities worldwide? Um, when they license their medical innovation, um, do they do so in globally responsible ways? And are universities educating the next generation about the crucial impact that academic institutions can have on global health 
through their research on licensing decisions. So this is what our Global Health um, Report Card website looks like. You can check it out yourself at globalhealthgrades.org. So we have a listing. Um, I mentioned we don't give any easy A's. So the organization ranked 56 research institutions in North America in our first inaugural version. This was published earlier in 2013. Um, so as you see, there is only actually one A because we don't, this is not a, we don't grade, we don't grade on a curve, but we grade based on what we think, you know, as students of medicine, law, public health, what we think that the academic research landscape should look like, which means that it essentially should um, mirror the burden of disease worldwide in terms of distribution of, re distribution of resources and that in managing intellectual property, um, if somebody wants to provide a health service to a neglected, pop to a neglected population, the company that may hold a monopoly over that technology should not prevent them from doing so. So navigating through this web page, you can hover over a particular school, and I encourage you to do so in, on your own time. So here we've hovered over Harvard, and we see that Harvard actually does quite well in access and empowerment. Um, this is partially, we hope, due to uh, the activism that our organization has been doing and the partnership that we've had with the Tech Transfer Office. Um, in terms of access, uh, but in terms of innovation, you may be surprised to see that Harvard doesn't have the best grade. Um, and then you can go into more detail and see the breakdown of that grade. Um, and using, we know that Harvard does a significant amount of innovation for HIV, TB, malaria, actually not so much for the other neglected diseases. And as a research powerhouse, the percentage of research money and percentage of development capacity for new research for neglected diseases does not correlate with the global burden of disease. Um, you can also compare um, univer you can also compare universities so who have chosen the three Boston universities and then you can compare them side by side so um, maybe you can talk about the findings a little later essentially the findings as reflected by the grades are that a very small proportion of research funding is dedicated to neglected disease research that some schools have great global access licensing policies and many don't um, and that very few educate students about these issues. So here's just a little bit of a quote in terms of our impact. Our results have been described by the press, so in the academic press, in national and international news, campus newspapers mostly decrying how their universities could do better, regional news, and uh, just to finish up, I wanted to put my contact info up here. Uh, again, um, our website is globalhealthgrades.org, and our um, group's website is uaem.org. So I look forward to speaking with many of you about this later. Thank you. Thank you. Now, our next speaker is not here, but uh, a video that he made before he left is here, uh, who's actually going to execute it? Professor Ruggie is based in the Kennedy School of Government <laughs> here at Harvard, and he's also duly appointed in Harvard Law School. Uh, he's long been involved in practical policy work, most notably uh, having drafted the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. They constitute to date the most comprehensive and authoritative global standard in the area of business and human rights, and also the subject of today's discussion. I thought we'd begin by talking about the process that you followed in developing the standards. I understand at the beginning it was mostly a descriptive mm -hmm. initiative. Th uh, that's correct. The, uh, this was a mandate under the uh, Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council. Um, and at first, um, they didn't really want me to do very much, uh, uh, except to um, identify what the uh, sort of major patterns were of corporate-related human rights uh, issues, um, and what the prevailing standards were that applied to states in relation to business and human rights, um, and what, if any, legal or other standards um, existed that applied to companies. So it was a very much a, a factual mapping exercise uh, initially. It was uh, an intensely consultative process. Uh, we conducted more than 50 um, or nearly 50 international consultations on every continent. So nobody could say, you didn't hear our story. Before we put together um, any set of recommendations, we wanted to try them out to see whether they'd actually work. So one of the things that we, we promoted very strongly in the guiding principles 
is the idea that companies ought to do what we call human rights due diligence, um, or ought to adopt human rights due diligence uh, processes. Um, bef before we said that, we actually worked with 10 companies to see what that would look like inside a company. How would it work? How would it be embedded into various business units and business functions? And they did that for a year or so uh, and issued a report. Uh, we consulted with corporate lawyers on the same subject. Uh, and then we had some concrete evidence how this could work in practice. So the 10 companies, did they help shape the standards or they really just helped test the standard? Um, the, we, came, we came to the exercise with some basic ideas uh, of what needed to be done. Um, none of us had ever worked inside a major multinational corporation. It wasn't until they tried to explain to their procurement department or to their Asian division or whatever what the issue was that we realized that there were uh, refinements that needed to be made um, and, uh, and, and better explanatory material that needed to be provided. I found something quite amazing. One, that you were able to get 10 companies to agree to anything, but more impressive is that you were able to get the International Chamber of Commerce to support your work, both the standards and their implementation. So how did that happen? Well, we reached out to all um, major stakeholder bodies right at the beginning. Uh, so the business community was present from the start, which they typically are not in human rights related issues. They're usually the target. Um, and it's uh, states and, and, and activist groups who are in the room doing the negotiation. I said from the beginning, that's not going to work. Kofi Annan said that he was looking for, and, and you had, um, a competency in both human rights and business, which was unique, but you also had a neutrality. This was such a controversial area. It was so, so deeply conflicted that to try to get a, a person from one of the major stakeholder groups to lead the process, mm -hmm. Um, what, what wouldn't have worked. So, so let's talk about the principles. So there mm -hmm. were 31 mm -hmm. in general. What themes did you cover um, and what did they look like? Well, the, um, the guiding principles um, rest on what we call three pillars. Um, one is the state duty to protect um, against human rights abuses by anybody, not only state agents, but uh, also uh, third parties, which by definition includes business. So um, the state duty to protect is the first core element. Secondly, um, an independent uh, corporate responsibility to respect rights. By independent, um, what we meant was that it wasn't dependent upon whether or not states were fulfilling their obligations. That this was a separate business responsibility. Um, and the third um, was access to remedy. Um, rights don't mean very much if uh, there is no access to remedy. And so protect, respect, remedy were the three pillars of the uh, guiding principle. Uh, there was a, a crucial decision that had to be made in the end, um, which is that um, we were exploring um, uh, the possibility of a legal uh, instrument that um, would, would hold companies to account for violation of gross human rights abuses that have, uh, rise to the level of international crimes. Um, and the, the message back from uh, governments more than anybody else was that that would be, that would in itself be such a complex exercise um, that um, there would be no way that the guiding principles could be adopted in the time frame that we had uh, if that were included. So I issued that as a second sort of recommendation, as a, as a separate recommendation. So I don't want to gloss over this um, sort of complicated nature. Why is it so complicated to make something um, legally binding for multinational companies? Well, the, the, the challenge of a, a treaty instrument, I mean, look how long we've been at Kyoto, right? We've, uh, and we still don't have um, an, an, an agreed um, uh, instrument. Um, when issues are very complex, when interests uh, are highly divergent, when you're aiming for universal coverage, all rights, all, in, all, all rights holders, mm -hmm. all countries, all businesses, um, it's, it, it is difficult to um, imagine that you're going to get a comprehensive legally binding instrument anytime soon. So the challenge really is can you set in motion 
um, steps that cu cumulatively reduce the incidence um, of corporate-related human rights harm uh, and eventually uh, um, build up enough of a basis for a sort of specific legal instruments uh, to be negotiated um, to fill gaps. What do you think about the idea of accreditation, certification, and rating systems as means for both perhaps specifying some of the principles um, as well as encouraging their implementation? Right, right. Well, one of the things that I was very keen to do is have, have governments um, that are supportive of the guiding principles. Um, and by the way, the endorsement in the Human Rights Council was unanimous, and so mm -hmm. then you can't get you can't get better. That was than amazing, that. right? You can't get better than that. But to encourage governments to um, to require report uh, uh, re, uh, human rights reporting. So in the United States now, um, any entity, any U.S. entity that invests more than five hundred thousand dollars in Myanmar, has to issue an annual report, including uh, its human rights impacts and how it's managing them. Now that's that's an important follow-up step. Now, now the next follow-up step comes, namely that there isn't a single reporting instrument available. So my team, which has now formed itself into a nonprofit, mm -hmm. it, together with an accounting firm, is developing reporting standards that then can be used. And then when the reporting standards are in place, the, ne the next step will be an assurance process that the reporting is accurate. And so the ball keeps rolling. And so what I found interesting about, the, I think you hint in the direction that you're headed, is that you're not just looking at policy, right? You're looking at outcomes. Oh, absolutely. So they have to have yeah. a process, but they have to show absolutely. that there was yeah. Um, yeah. evidence of outcome, yeah. Yeah. successful out implementation. Yeah. yeah, I mean, negotiating a piece of paper is easy. Mm -hmm. making, making things happen on the ground is where the challenge is. Wrapping up, um, what have been the effects on companies and human rights um, since the implementation of the guiding principles. Uh, do you see businesses becoming more just and um, human rights field advancing since, since their adoption? Well, uh, you can't generalize about all, there's 88,000 multinational companies in the world and there's something like 800,000 subsidiaries and, and I, I can't keep track of all of those. Um, but I, I certainly see a much greater um, interest in and a much greater capacity um, to do the kinds of uh, human rights due diligence um, that, uh, that we recommended, uh, to establish grievance mechanisms uh, that people have access to. Um, and on the part of governments, um, uh, the adoption of national implementation plans, on the part of stock exchanges, um, um, listing requirements, reporting requirements, they're, they're, they're proliferating um, at, at a considerable pace. Uh, we're working very closely still um, in our nonprofit capacity with governments um, from Latin America to Southeast Asia uh, and with companies um, everywhere uh, to, uh, to embed these things. Um, and in the meantime, the various regulatory agencies, you know, this worked its way into, uh, into U.S. regulation. It's worked its way into EU regulation. Um, so th th there is a momentum there that, that, that we don't have to worry about it. It's, it's moving on its own. Right. You've provided us with a set of standards and principles that we can rally around. So you've defined for us what we should be looking for. And now it sounds like we can focus on the implementation piece mm -hmm. um, in greater and greater detail every day. So thank you, John, for taking this time. Thank you. Learned so much, and can't, I can't thank you enough. No, it's great. Thank you so much. Good luck with the conference. Thank you. Now that uh, gave you an, an example of the issue of whether you applaud someone who's not here. <laughs> and apparently the answer is no. Uh, you just heard from uh, Jennifer Miller in the interview. Now you get to hear her, from her uh, in person to discuss her own uh, rating system for pharmaceutical companies. Jennifer? Thank you, Dan. So. As Dan mentioned, I want to talk a little bit about a rating system that I developed and I'm piloting here at Harvard uh, for the pharmaceutical industry, looking at a very specific and narrow issue of 
missing and misleading information for newly approved drugs in trial registries and the medical literature. So briefly, I want to talk a little bit about this problem. So in general, there are three primary sources for objective information about drugs in the United States. The first one is the information that the FDA releases on a drug, so you can think of a drug label. The second is um, the summary results that a pharmaceutical company posts in a government website called clinicaltrials.gov, so in a trial registry. And the third is the medical literature. These foundational sources supply most of the information, the objective information, in all other drug information delivery systems. But studies show that the last two sources uh, have missing and misleading information. So for example, on the issue of missing information, uh, some studies show that only 50% of clinical trial results are findable in the government website uh, and about three years after the completion of a trial. And in terms of the medical literature, another study shows that 25 to 50 percent of clinical trial results remain unpublished for several years after their completion. That study was actually conducted by Joe Ross, who's sitting at the end of this table. Um, and results that are missing from the literature are likely to be in very invisible, meaning that if they're unpublished, 78 percent, a study shows that 78 percent of unpublished studies are also likely to be unreported. Uh, that's for large trials. So the conclusion is that there may be oceans of missing and misleading information about newly approved drugs. And then the results that we do have may, off may be misleading. So they can be misleading in two ways. There can, be, there can be biased reporting and biased outcome reporting. So favorable results in general are twice as likely to be published in the medical literature than unfavorable results. Favorable results means things that make a drug look good to sell more products. Biased outcome reporting, um, a good example of this is the salicoxib case. Uh, there was an article published in JAMA about the drug, and the article was based on outcomes at six months, but the full trial outcome was 12 months. And one might ask why, and it was because the drug looked pretty good at six months and quite useless at 12. Uh, and there's a forthcoming paper, again by Joe Ross, showing that 99% of papers have some sort of discrepancy in them. So why do we care about this problem of missing and misleading information in these primary sources? Well, one, because it's, it could pose a significant public health problem. Uh, the IOM states that it puts millions of patients at risk of using ineffective and unsafe drugs, even for common illness, illnesses like arthritis, depression, and high cholesterol. And it raises an important question of how doctors, informed patients, and policymakers are supposed to make uh, informed healthcare decisions if their body of evidence is corrupted. It also contradicts what companies claim to stand for on their mission statements. So if you look at Pfizer's statement, uh, it says we're working together for a healthier world. It doesn't sound like they're working with uh, patients and physicians if they're withholding information that they need to make themselves healthier. Uh, Merck uh, says something be well. And then J&J's credo says we believe our first responsibility is to doctors, nurses, and patients, and uh, very apple pie there. Uh, so. So that's one of the reasons of why I'm focusing on this issue. And so the question becomes, what can we do to fix, fix the problem? And my theory is that a rating system can improve the integrity of the evidence available to inform doctors, patients, policymakers, payers, and others. So then, then the question is, what would it look like? Um, so the pilot that I put together and I'm conducting looks at how complete and reliable the information is by looking at four things. Um, and I'm focusing on the drugs that the FDA approved in 2012. So the FDA approved 39 products in 2012. And I'll be looking at the ones manufactured by the large pharma and biotech. So that's 13 drugs. So first, you find the total number of clinical trials that were conducted for a drug. And then you look to see how many of those clinical trials are registered in the government website, how many have summary results, and then how many were published. So that's, is it findable? And then the question is, is it reliable? So then you do an integrity review. Um, and that, I won't go into the deep details, but basically you're comparing the consistency between the information in FDA approval packages, the registries, and the papers for basic information, um, such as are the adverse events all included, uh, are primary and secondary endpoints accurate, and this type of review would have caught the celecoxib type manipulation in a paper. 
So the data needed to perform this type of review is now publicly available thanks to advances in transparency by government agencies. It just needs to be put together in a way that hasn't been done before. And the end result of the pilot should be a clear picture of how complete and reliable the information is for new drugs in registries and the literature. So for example, a doctor or a policymaker might be able to see that there were 30 trials conducted on a particular drug, but only 15 have summary results and perhaps only seven were published, and it was probably the favorable results. And of those seven publications, say four were misleading in X, Y, and Z ways. So I'm roughly 50% of, of the way through this pilot. Um, and are now thinking about how to expand the rating system if it makes sense to address other bioethical concerns. And so I'm, the second uh, iteration will likely look at whether companies submit their drugs for regulatory approval in the countries where they are tested. So conservatively, about 40 to 60% of clinical trials are now conducted outside the United States, often in developing countries. And anecdotes hint that companies will run their clinical trials in developing countries, but they don't necessarily submit their products uh, for regulatory approval there. So now I want to wrap up. Uh, lessons learned from reviewing 50 types of rating and accreditation systems and trying out my, to build my own and piloting it. Uh, four things. One, rating and accreditation are quite different. One way to think about this difference is that rating focuses on outcomes uh, often and accreditation on whether there's a policy or process in place within the institution that's believed to achieve an outcome. Ratings often rely on public data. Accreditations often but not always rely on data and information supplied by the companies and the employees being evaluated. So I chose a rating model instead of uh, an accreditation system in part to avoid the problem of being lied to by employees in interviews and receiving partial or biased data from companies. I suspect different sectors need different types of models. Um, I personally found it easier to rate products rather than companies, and I think for me I found there was a danger in putting a label on an entire company. It could give a false impression of more goodness or merit than deserved. For example, I originally toyed with the idea of putting a bioethics seal on companies that scored well in my rating system. Uh, imagine it being more comprehensive than it is. However, I realized that in my case, no matter how comprehensive a system, it couldn't rate every bioethical issue, and I worried the label would provide a fig leaf for issues that fell outside of the scope of the label, and there would always be issues that fell outside the scope. Um, last two things, funding models. We've learned a lot from credit rating agencies. Uh, they typically have systemic conflicts of interest. They financially rely on the income uh, from fees paid by the organizations that they rate. Rough, in 2005, roughly 90% of credit rating agency revenues were from issuer fees. Uh, this conflict is avoidable. In fact, uh, in the 1970s, most credit rating agencies earned their income from independent subscription fees paid by investors, not the companies that they rated. Um, lastly, if you must take industry funding, I urge people to consider blinding the funding in two ways, blinding by company, but also blinding by industry, perhaps taking sources from other places. And lastly, uh, salience and meaningfulness. This is the behavioral economics literature. Um, for ratings to be effective, the results must be displayed in ways that are salient and useful for those who need it. The system should signal to the right people in uh, the right ways. Thank you. Uh, the uh, organizers didn't uh, give any li time limit to the, uh, the chairs of the sessions. <laughs> and I want to make uh, just a comment of an another interesting source of information. Uh, I believe it, I'm a philosopher by training, and, but I got hired by some lawyers uh, on several occasions, but one in particular that I'm thinking of, um, <clears throat> involving um, the use of uh, uh, Neurontin which is probably the most litigated drug uh, on the market. Its, uh, it's off-label use peaked at 94%, uh, which is extraordinary, I think. But um, there was a lot of um, information that was, uh, became discoverable and became uh, public. And uh, I don't think of myself as a naive person. Uh, probably some others do, but uh, uh, the, the way that um, 
information was uh, manipulated uh, in was was displayed um, quite vividly in uh, discoverable uh, documents documents that became public and uh, that's another source of information for you which um, may get you things that isn't that, that the companies don't want to be public but become public now uh, the floor is open to you I'll, I'll give some preference to those who are sitting around the uh, what's not a round table but uh, a three sides of a rectangle and then um, also to uh, uh, the other participants here your your comments n need not be directed at a particular person as I've already said uh, they can be if you wish yes Of that is to um, is to you know to raise the ratings. So, do um, you have any f information on, on the feedback as to how the schools or the companies respond to these ratings? Do they care about them? Sure. So I'll get started. Um, um, so the organization definitely does, and uh, the report card is a annual iterative process. The first annual one was just released last spring, but there will be another version, and uh, input was taken extremely seriously um, by the team that was developing the scorecard. So there was input mostly from uh, academic administrators who care very deeply about their school's ratings. Uh, and then there, you know, we put the input into two categories, so one which we um, adapt uh, into the scorecard, and then the other type of, uh, of criticism which um, which we have to push back on um, because obviously administrators have their own vested interests and we are rating them so clearly we can't give on every on every side uh, one of the most important pieces of input was to make the name of the report card more specific so rather and to give it a subtitle so rather than a global health impact report card which is um, justifiably so it uh, their comments were quite justified that that was overly broad so we subtitled it as a global health impact for the most neglected health needs and emphasize the three subsections. Um, but we definitely pushed back against including things like uh, study abroad programs, uh, working in you know, a lab abroad for two weeks because such things do not have a direct and measurable impact on the health of neglected communities. Uh, I think it's a little early to say uh, about this particular report card. Universities have responded to UAM's activism in general. Um, in particular, uh, several years ago, a consortium of universities released the statement of principles and strategies for the responsible um, for the equitable dissemination of medical technologies. And since that time, uh, the signatory list has grown to include over 30 schools, including most of the institutions in Boston. Um, so that's a step. So they do respond to outside pressure. Um, at least four institutions who have been rated um, have responded, have given feedback that they plan to institute a written global access policy in response to, um, to this rating. So, uh, and there's a bit of precedent for the global access uh, licensing side. Uh, for the neglected disease research side, obviously there's a limited pot of money uh, for research. So we hope that uh, the impact will also kind of spread out to, to also include funding agencies so that um, it's not the same institutions fighting for the same tiny slice of uh, neglected disease research money. As, as with any uh, uh, trying to tease out causal, uh, causal influence, it's difficult here because there's, as probably everyone here knows, there's a great interest in global health uh, issues in universities and in medical schools in particular and a lot of growth in uh, that work. So 
uh, there are a lot of factors that are pushing in this uh, direction, uh, hopefully a positive direction. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, Bob? Sounds like this is on. So I'm, I'm Bob Trug, and I wanted to ask, uh, for a couple of years I served on a committee uh, that advised the Harvard Corporation around how to vote at um, shareholder meetings for the companies that uh, uh, Harvard has invested in. And um, uh, I was wondering, um, we read a lot of, of reports that advised us about how we should recommend uh, the vote should go. And would these be the kinds of ratings that you think would be, first of all, read by groups like our committee? And would they be effective? Um, and then for the universities themselves, would the way that universities voted on some of these feedback into how the university would get ranked around these issues? Um, or is that something that you look at? Uh, so I'm sort of asking, I'm, I'm naive to this, how, how important are, are these meetings and the kinds of votes that occur, and what kind, if, if they are important, what kind of impact can you have? Uh, so I guess in general there's, there are five and only four coming to mind, sort of sources, for leverage points. Um, for getting a, a company to, to change. One of them is investors, and just the other ones are the employees, both current and prospective employees, regulators, consumers, patients, things like that. Um, potential partners with companies in mergers and acqu acquisitions. Interestingly, I didn't think for my program that investors were going to be a, a low-hanging sort of leverage point, but the investor community, when I gave a presentation in New York City, several of them uh, that had socially screened indexes came up to me and said, could we use your information um, or could we build it into our, our, our index? And I thought, you know, that's a really great idea. Let's explore that um, further. So certainly it seems like a possibility for, for at least my project. Um, and for our project, uh, investors have not been uh, a major target so far, and it might be a, it would be a long road before they would become a large target. We focus on the companies, startups and uh, pharmaceutical companies that license technologies from universities. Um, that's more in our domain, and I think that uh, investor advocacy is just not one of our strengths. It's not where we have the most leverage. But there, there has been an increase as all you know, I suspect. Uh, there has been an increase in the degree to which organizations like CalPERS and others uh, are becoming active in, uh, in shareholder votes, and uh, so there's a potential for, for an increase in that in the future. I, I was wondering if Steve Landberg would, might want to chime in on this. Uh, Steve is a big actor in the world of ethical investment. Specifically, should the Harvard Corporation be talking to people who have long-standing expertise in ethical investment and kind of maybe we as a university should be trying to get more into this business? Well, I, I think Jennifer's point was uh, a, a very good one. This is exactly the kind of information when it relates to specific companies, to speci very specific issues, particularly information that allows you to distinguish the record of one company versus another. So uh, you know, I was disappointed to hear you're only halfway through your, uh, your study at the moment. So. Uh, yes, I think this is the kind of information that this is the kind of information that you would find would work its way into the investor community, and once it worked its way into the investor community, uh, and there are shareholder resolutions, then it would come up to the level of the Harvard Corporation. I did have a uh, question for sure. you. I was impressed with both of the uh, presentations. Both of the systems seemed very interesting uh, and uh, thorough. I am. Uh, also uh, interested in um, the longevity of these kinds of uh, enterprises. Um, they are, um, uh, can be expensive to do and hard to figure out how to fund long term. I was wondering if either of you would like to comment on how you get all this work done and how you're going to continue to, uh, the, your models for getting that work done on long term. Uh, so to start off, um Volunteers are, uh, have, have, many, uh, have many benefits, including that they come quite cheap. So um, the labor for the um, universities allied for essential medicines um, report card is, 
in the vast majority, it's uh, filled by student volunteers. We have a very small staff. Um, and then we have several committed funders. Um, so we are lucky that our funders uh, fund you know, mainly just the very small staff and then travel to our annual conference. Uh, so again, very minimal costs. Um, and I will mention, I will add that uh, our, um, our organization strives to avoid conflict of interest. So all of our funding, of course, comes from nonprofit institutions, um, uh, public and private foundations. So below your chair, you'll find a hat that we're passing around. <laughs> 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 um, funding is an incredible challenge. So for my project, I've been really lucky when I've just been explaining it to people at conferences, I've been able to get significant um, seed funding from private foundations. Um, and universities, so Harvard has been quite generous uh, allowing me to pilot the project. Um, but future funding is something that I need to think about and sustainability. So, you know, PBS is funded on donations. I don't really want to go the PBS route where you rely on uh, constantly fundraising and I'm a terrible fundraiser. Um, so it's, it's certainly a problem. I, I don't see an easy to go, a go-to source for these type of, of, problem, of, fun, of um, projects. As you pointed out, student labor is even cheaper than the labor at 7-Eleven uh, and the uh, fast food places. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I, I have a question about topic selection. Um, you know, from these two examples that we have heard, or three examples if you count John Ruggie's, which isn't really in the health area, it's clear that there are you know, any number of dozens of topics that you could develop rating or labeling systems on in the global health arena. And um, I'll be talking a little bit later about you know, the, the triage question. But you know, there's only so much attention that investors or, or other users of the labels have. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about uh, you know, how to select things that are particularly important to, to try to apply ratings to. I think here in this area, um, I mean, I'll say a word on a focus on global health issues in general, um, as opposed to other just causes around the world. And these, the footprints that we're talking about focus in that area. I feel that this is a particularly fruitful area to focus on because of the point about uh, the donkey and the elephant in the clip. Um, if you have, a, so during the Iraq war, um, some people were boycotting French wines, and other people, uh, like uh, one person on this uh, this table, was actually targeting French wines for buying them to kind of uh, create a balance. Um, I think my market power and the people who were kind, of, were kind of balancing out each other, and it was basically a waste of everybody's money. Um, if there is an area which is both very important, major impact on you know, human welfare, and one that generally the donkey and the elephant could agree on, then you do have a potential enormous leverage. So if we are focused, so it's kind of fortunate that global health by and large, and there are many exceptions, by and large is one of these areas where you know, if you focus on some interventions we're going to talk about in the next session, some students will tell us about their charitable donations to mind-bogglingly cost-effective charities. Um, these are some of the most important interventions, and everybody agrees on them. It's a low-hanging, huge fruit. Um, why not start there? So Paul Wilson is a big actor in, in the world of uh, rating for the, the speaker, the, um, rating about global warming issues. I think that we would here be somewhat freer than you are uh, with respect to the kind of problematics of disagreement on fundamental issues. Um, what I was trying to say was that within the area of global health, there are dozens and dozens of things you could rate, and do you have any thoughts on how to choose among them? So, for my project, I did a lot of due diligence, right? You don't want, you don't, there's obviously a risk of having rating fatigue um, by the consumers. So, <coughs> I, what, if you're starting a rating system, you'd just like when you start a business, you'd want to do your market analysis, right? See what's being done, where the gaps are, and how you fit into the pictures. So what I did is I, I only am looking at places where there are gaps, where there are critical public health needs and critical ethics needs, and also to the extent possible, collaborating with those that are already in the space. 
So I'm very fortunate that in my space, it's very narrow, right? Bioethics and public health issues. So there really isn't a lot of people in that space, but there are some actors. Um, there's Access to Medicines Index, which looks at how accessible uh, drugs and vaccines are globally. And Nicole, who's going to talk later, is emerging into the space. Um, so the extent that we can collaborate and mutually support the projects um, and be able to signal to investors, hey, here, if you're interested, here's the big picture, and here's where you can turn for each of those um, pieces, I would think that would help. So one little word about your actual question, then, Paul. Thank you for um, by and large, what we're looking at today is ways to try to direct trading more into um, the areas where you would have the most impact on health as, uh, as we could try to assess this, the theme of the panel that's coming right now um, in relation to m new tools to assess the global burden of disease and what risk factors affected the most. Um, and, but there are other factors I'll just mention. You know, maybe it's fruitful to focus, like John Ruggie, on areas where you can achieve consensus with all the big powers that have a say on this. Maybe we'll hear later today. Um, uh, it's very important to hear what the communities affected want to see, regardless of what you, the expert, think is, uh, has the most impact on uh, global health. Um, and I'll add to that because UAM has, uh, has grappled with the issue of mission creep and staying true to our mission for years, basically for as long as we've, we've existed, which is a little over 10 years, and uh, constantly you know, uh, allies and students will ask us to focus on um, other issues that they're particularly inter interested in, but um, the, I think the stewards of UAM have a very strong interest in maintaining our core mission because it's complementary to so many of the, um, of the efforts that are already uh, underway. So for example, our rating system is completely complementary to the rating systems that are, to the other rating systems that are described today. And it would be a fool's errand to go out and to attempt to do something that others are already doing when um, we would be better off staying in the position where we can leverage the particular skills that we have as students, uh, the particular position of leverage and power that we have as students, and to address those most neglected issues where others are not as well, not as well situated, um, and maybe are not as interested in addressing those issues. For example, in the licensing, um, we demand transparency from our institutions, and uh, that's something that as students and as stakeholders in, in the institution, as well as you know some of the um, hands that create the intellectual property, we have a particular uh, position um, in which to um, exert that leverage. Yeah. Could folks um, also could tell us what's your name, Nina? Oh, so I'm Yan Hashia at the Harvard Business School. Um, I take it that one of the assumptions is that by producing these ratings, we'll have a positive impact um, with regard to the areas of concern that we're talking about, assuming we can sort of figure out which areas are there. But is it possible that once the information is there, people might actually act in other ways. So back to your French wine example, Nia, right? <laughs> Presumably the goal was to subsidize French wine production so that the war in Iraq would not, there'd be sort of forces against it. But suppose everybody finds out that, oh wow, this, you know, I'd rather invest in this company that's sort of obfuscating um, you know, the drug trial results, things like this. So, and that's not a great example, but the point is just that, 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 that the assumption seems to be that this information will, will produce the kinds of results that all of you are sort of hoping to produce, but it may not do so. So I'm wondering how much of the value of this really isn't actually in producing certain results, but just more about transparency in general, and that's sort of what you all are, are sort of pushing for. So I'd be interested to hear about the value of transparency as being the underlying so, um, concern instead. So Nene, that is a great question. That's the growing edge of my research. Um, so I'm about to embark on something that I don't know a lot about, I apologize. Um, but so the way you can, the way I'm starting to think about this is there, as there being social um, incentives and financial incentives. And we all know the classic example. There was a preschool where the parents always picked up their kids late. And so the preschool thought, oh, we'll try and get the parents to be on time by imposing a fine. And the incentive will be the, the parents don't want to have to pay the fine, so they'll arrive on time. Well, it turned out it backfired, and the parents were late more often because they saw it as a pay for service. Um, so clearly incentives don't always work. Uh, so I'm, 
so that's why if you go back to our original leverage points, there were five. Some of them were um, financial incentives, but others were social incentives. So if you think about the employees within companies, um, a lot of employees themselves would like to do the right thing if they could, but they sometimes don't have s the system in place where good people can be good, right? Rotten barrels. Um, so I'm, all, I'm now thinking about how do you play on the, the, that altruism, that social uh, incentive. Um, and I think that might be part of the answer to your question. Another part is to study what are the results of these <laughs> projects. Yeah, and there's, a, there's this aspect of uh, a movement kind of growing up. So UAM could have never um, embarked on a rating system like this uh, um, in our earlier years. It was only until we had you know, tried and tested certain advocacy approaches and we realized that they were gaining steam and then the time was ripe to generate this rating system and there is a bit of a mass effect. So a certain university would have a very hard time being the first one to say, well, we're gonna make our licensing even harder. You know, we're gonna make crossing the valley of death for uh, technologies even harder. But they did so as a coalition you know, with guidance, with uh, pressure from multiple parties, including ours. Um, so there was a mass effect. Um, so um, as mentioned before, continuing to study the feedback will remain a crucial uh, part of our, of our operations. Josh? Josh Solomon from Harvard School of Public Health. Pushing a button is, is much too hard for an academic. <laughs> uh, you know, red to me means stop, right? So it's, it's the color coding that's thrown me. But picking up on the conversation um, that, that we've just been having, um, a, a couple of thoughts. One on this question of, of what to measure and the proliferation of, of rating schemes. I think inevitably, um, if there's a success, am I out of time already? Um, <laughs> if, if this is We're successful, five minutes from the next session. if this is successful and does inspire other efforts, um, then there may well be a, a kind of dashboard of ratings, and and, um, and there may and that may lead to a question how you aggregate across them. Um, you know, a company does well on this, poorly on that. Uh, how do you, how do you make sense of that? And for investors. Um, thinking about financial performance, we have a natural way to aggregate in terms of dollars here, um, much less so. And, and so I think there's a question of, of where, that, um, where that leaves us. The second uh, on the choice of what to measure is that I think there's a natural tendency to measure the things that are relatively easy to measure. Um, and kind of along the lines of, of unintended consequences. One of the unintended consequences of that is that companies may start teaching to the test and so you're not necessarily rating them on the things that are most vitally important, but the things that um, it's possible to obtain data and reasonable, credible metrics. Uh, and then that become that, that tends to drive the, the, the focus uh, of countries. Uh, so just uh, not necessarily for, for comment, but just wanted to, um, to put those two issues out. And I think they follow a little bit from some of the discussions that we've had so far. Josh has worked uh, extensively on the Global Burden of Disease Project, which had a lot of measurement uh, issues to tackle, so he has experience on this. Other comments? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm David Ports from uh, Equitable Origin. Uh, one of the topics that was brought up, just mentioned, I think is really important and maybe can be discussed further throughout the day, is just the relationship between a product or a macro level certification versus, uh, excuse me, the relationship between a macro level certification or a product or in my cir circumstances looking at a macro level certification versus like an asset, for example, an oil site or a gas site or a, again, there are many examples throughout different sectors. And I think it goes to the issue of credibility of these systems, which is really core to their long-term success. So again, I'd, I'd be curious to see kind of how that relates specifically to a public health context because um, Many people do want simplicity because when there are too many product level certifications, there is this oversaturation. But at the same time, we see that when you place a very broad certification, it often lacks rigor. So anyway, I think these are just some things that potentially could be discussed uh, throughout the day. So. Shall we allow one more question and then we'll
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Govind Prasad at Medical Ethics at Penn, and I guess I had another question about um, uh, potential counterproductive effects um, here having to do with um, dangers about overly narrow scope rather than overly broad scope in terms of missions. So um, think about a kind of analogy to food labeling. Say that if you can get um, calorie labeling at only chain restaurants, you could end up with a um, sort of counterproductive effect where then people end up going to unlabeled restaurants. I go to the food truck outside and buy food that ends up being even worse. So if you rate, say, um, all the pharma companies, and I'm a senior at Harvard trying to decide whether I should, you know, go to work at Merck or go to work at somewhere like, say, um, Snapchat um, or do something that has nothing to do with global health at all, perhaps, like um, be a classicist. Um, I think there's a normative question as well as a, so is it just sort of expediency that justifies um, focusing on pharmaceutical companies or is there some normative reason why it makes sense to label Merck and pharmaceutical companies in comparison to one another but not compare things to industries more broadly like the financial industry or other forms of entrepreneurship that don't relate to health at all? Um, in fact, we, we would like today to kind of open a broader discussion. So some labels would be for pharma companies, uh, but uh, David, who just spoke, is um, rating companies in the oil and gas extraction industry, which have perhaps more impact on human health than some small pharma companies. Um, our thinking is uh, the social determinants of health have a big impact on health. A lot of companies have a big impact of health, on health, even in terms of drug availability, because some companies prov help their workers, say, in Southern Africa, obtain antiretrovirals. Uh, some companies, through their philanthropic donations, uh, donate money to causes that eventually reach uh, drug availability. So for all these reasons, uh, we should probably be in the business of rating um, potentially any old company. Um, for if, if it has uh, a big health impact, direct or indirect. I think we should, should we? Should we sir, do, you, stop. do you want to chime in on this? Quick, quick comment. Um, two, well, two things. One, a uh, rating system names and shames. It doesn't just shame. So the distrust, if you look at the pharmaceutical industry, the distrust is already pervasive. I think 12% of the US population trusts drug companies are generally honest and ethical. Um, so while there's a risk that this narrow rating system could drive the trust lower, um, I couldn't speak to how substantial that risk is. So if you're inclined to work in industries that are higher trusted or more trustworthy than others, then you perhaps would work at a different industry regardless of the results of the rating. But what the rating might tell you is which company within the industry to think about since it's going to name and shame, not just shame and make the whole industry look bad. But your point is well taken, I think, for people thinking about what do they want to do with their lives. Then, because uh, I look back at leaving the investment industry 50 years ago for academia, and I, I would have been helped by uh, this kind of information. I think we're going to stop. Uh, well, I know we're going to stop because I'm going to stop us. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, we'll go on to the next session, but let's thank the participants in this session. We're moving right along without any break.